crank. So there's one little marble up to the top and sends it down, that whole thing. That's actually one of our pastors at Shoreline made that. Pastor Walt, it's in his office over in building two. If you ever want to go over and take a look at it and you know, play with that toy, it's really exciting. But uh, uh, just uh, that one little crank starts this whole chain reaction. We've been talking in this series about how, how little things can have a huge impact. And we're, we're studying these three, uh, we've studied, this will be our third, and then next week a fourth and final little book in the smallest books of the New Testament. They're each only one chapter long. And these tiny little books have a huge and massive impact. And and we we looked the first two weeks of this series at 2 John and 3 John, and and we really talked about how how there's there's, there's both, you see, love and truth. We had these signs up here, and and the, the idea that we looked at with John is that he was looking at this balance of love and truth, but now we're getting into Jude, and Jude, in his book, he talks about holding to the truth even when it hurts, to hold on to the truth. So what we discover from Jude is he says, Yes, I absolutely understand that love is critical. Love's important. We've got to focus on love. There's a balance of these two. But Jude is saying, but let me be honest with you. My primary focus is truth. I'm not blocking out love, but I'm saying truth is where I'm going to put my focus because in the churches in the first century, there were people coming into influence and leadership, pastors and leaders and elders in the church who were misleading people. They were bringing false teaching and working against Jesus Christ, and working against the truth. And so Jude is responding, and I gotta tell you, Jude is intense. If you've been doing, every week we make a Bible reading guide for the week, and we actually, if you've done that reading, you've been reading the book of Jude every single day for the last week, and you might be saying, this is intense. Where where are we going with this? What's this all about? Because, Because Jude gets very, very serious about the importance of the truth. And what Jude is really saying is he's saying there's times where we need to fight the battle. We need to stand up and fight the battle. And and I would say before we look at the the battle we need to fight, I would suggest there's some battles that might not be worth fighting over. We're in a culture now that's so argumentative, so polarized, that there's these battles going on, and, and, and there's battles that probably aren't really important. I used an illustration a few weeks ago about licorice, about black licorice, how people have different tastes. When it comes to black licorice, licorice, people tend to either love it or not like it. And I had lots of black licorice conversations since that sermon. I'm hoping that wasn't the, the only thing someone took from the message uh, was about black licorice. But, but also, uh, I actually had somebody give me a box of Good and Plenty, which are those little pink and white candies with the black licorice inside of them. Uh, and so, but I also have found out in talking with people that there's a real battle going on in the red licorice world as well. Um, <laughs> And I, I find people are telling me they have very strong feelings about the appropriate, the best red licorice. Anybody know what, anybody know what that battle is? So look up on the screen here. This is a red vines versus Twizzlers. It seems to be a big issue. I don't want to, I'm not even going to ask because I don't want to have families divided. I don't want to have the church break up over red vines and Twizzlers. But, but let me tell you, there's some battles that we have that I think we should just go, we just should say to ourselves, Red vines and Twizzlers. It's, it's, it's just not that important. I mean, it's, it's okay that you have a preference and taste on your licorice. You can disagree with each other, but let's not break up marriages, families, and the church over that, right? And there's other things like that. How, how about, I've been a pastor a long time now. Here, here's what I think is a red vines and Twizzlers issue. Music style in the church. Oh, I some groans. No, that's core. That's salvation. No, it's style. And when I have people come visit Shoreline and they'll say, you know, you know I, I like the church, but I, you know, I, like, I like the hymn books and I like the from the hymn book and I like the organ music and that's what I'm looking for. What I say to them is normally I say, is that really important to you? And they say, that's really important. I'll say, hey, listen, I got a couple of great churches for you to visit. You should go visit Carmel Press and Carmel, great Bible pre- preaching church, but the, you're going to get the, the hymn books and the organ music. You're gonna, and and if, you, that's, if that's a big deal, that's great. And we can, we can have different tastes and styles of music, but can I say something? Let's not battle over it. If Jesus watches his church breaking up over music style, I think Jesus says, red vines and Twizzlers. He says, don't don't let the body of Christ break up over that. End times teachings. How will all of history wrap up? How will the end of time, and, and there's Christians that have strong feelings and deep convictions. They read books and study the Bible and they have charts and graphs and they have strong feelings. But I would say when it comes to exactly how history's gonna wrap up, I would say red vines and Twizzlers. It's worth, it's worth talking about, yes. Worth having a class about, sure. Is it worth having a debate with a friend? Absolutely, I love debating my friends. I like disagreeing with people, it's kind of fun. I mean, I love to, but I still love them. It's not worth, you know, 
know what I'm saying? There's things that are worth talking about, debating about, but they're not worth breaking. And if Jesus watches churches break up about, he, he says, okay, I'm watching my church get fractured because they're fighting over what's going to happen when I return. And my body, the body of Christ is being broken. I think that breaks the heart of Jesus. It's red vines and Twizzlers. There's some things that just aren't important enough to, to say, I'm going to stand my ground and I'm going to battle over this thing. But what Jude is telling us is some battles are worth fighting. There are times where we should say, here's the line, I stand on it, and I cannot compromise. Because I'm standing on the word of God. And I'm standing in the name of Jesus Christ. Some battles are worth fighting. Some are red vines and twizzlers, yes. But some battles are worth fighting. And the central battle that Jude is talking about in this book is what we believe about Jesus Christ. Do we hold to him? Do we hold to faith in his name and salvation in his name? And we understand both his truth and his love and his grace, how this all fits together. And Jude is addressing this with absolute intense clarity. And so if you have your Bibles with you, open the book of Jude. If you have your Bible app, you can open up your Bible app to the book of Jude. If you have a paper Bible like this and you say, I'm not sure where Jude is, just start at the back. Go to Revelation, first book, book in the back of the Bible, and then just turn left. You'll find Jude. It's just only one page. Here's the whole book of Jude in, in my Bible, one page and a little paragraph. And so it's just a small little book, but if you go to Revelation and turn left, you'll find the book of Jude. And we're going to look at what kind of the story that Jude is telling and what he's addressing and try to get a sense of it because I think it applies to the church today. It applies to Christians today just as much as it did 2,000 years ago. So here's the first thing we see in the book of Jude. Jude is saying to us, be ready to hold to your faith and fight for it, even when it hurts. If, you have a, if you're a note taker in your bulletin, you'll see a place to write some notes down there. Be ready to hold to your faith and fight for your faith, even when it hurts. Look at verse 3 of Jude. Jude says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, he says, I want to write a letter all about our salvation, just kind of celebrating Jesus. But he says, something came up that's, that's important that we have to address. Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to, you ready for this? Contend for the faith. Fight for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Jude says, I, I want to write to you and talk about this, the great salvation of Jesus, but there's a problem, there's a battle going on. And I want to call you to contend, to stand, to fight for your faith. There are some things that are worth standing up and fighting for. And so he calls them to that. And we're going to see that unfold through this small book that Jude wrote. So here's a question. How do we willingly become uncomfortable in a world of comfort? If you're a follower of Jesus, are there times where you say, I'm going to be uncomfortable? Because you know, when you stand and fight for something, it's never comfortable. It's always, you're drawing a line. And you're saying, you know, I, I love you, but I disagree with that. No, I love you, but I won't compromise on that. And to do this, we have to willingly choose to be uncomfortable. But remember this. When Jesus called people to follow him, when Jesus said, if you want to follow me, here's what he said. Here's what, if you want to follow me, this, this is all you got to do. This is it, right? Just deny yourself every day, take up your cross, and walk my path. Easy, right? Just every day deny what you want. You know? Every day be willing to die and be crucified, and every day follow where I lead you. Does that, does that sound easy to anybody? Does that, does that sound easy to anybody? What's the answer? No. I mean, Jesus said, part of following me is not following yourself. Because why? Because you're following me. That's a challenge. But, but to choose to stand for what the Bible teaches is true is to choose a place of discomfort. Will we choose to be uncomfortable sometimes because we stand for Jesus? I've been a pastor now for well over half of my life, for about 35 years, and, and I, there's times where I make a stand and I get the, you're a bad person. You're a mean pastor. You're unloving. I've, I've heard it all only because I'm saying, well, no, I'm just agreeing with what the Bible says and sticking with Jesus on this one. Well, you're mean and you're unloving. No, I'm trying to be faithful to God's word. But it's uncomfortable when people come against you and say you're unkind, unloving because you hold to what Jesus says. But Christians make that decision again and again and again. And if you're not yet a Christian and you become a follower of Jesus, I want to let you right know right now, it won't always be comfortable, and it won't always be easy. Following Jesus is not always easy, but it is always the right thing to do. The next thing that Jude kind of begins to unfold is why we must know what we believe deeply. 
why we must know what we believe. We've got to know what we believe, and we've got to know it at the core of our being. If you become a follower of Jesus, let me tell you, you better learn what it means to be a Christian. And you better know what this book says, the word of God. If you've been a Christian for three months or three years or 30 years, man, you better get to know God's word and know what you believe. Why? Look at verse four of Jude. Jude says, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago, Old Testament prophecy that there'd be false teachers that would be condemned, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people. Now listen to this. Who pervert the grace of our God into license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. She says, there are people who have weaseled their way and snuck their way into the church. And some of them have the title pastor, and some of them have the title priest, and some of them have the title reverend, and some of them have the title elder, and some of them have the title Sunday school teacher. There's people who get into the church, but they have bad intentions in mind. I mean, Jude is pointing this out, and he's saying, you, you better know what you believe, because when people come in with false teaching, you better be able to stand against it. Because he says, it's going to happen then, it's going to happen now, and until Jesus returns, it will happen because human beings are broken and sinful. And so, so what happens is Jude gives these two massive warnings, and I believe they apply to our world today. Here's warning number one that he gives. Watch out for those who use God's grace as an excuse for immoral behavior. He says, watch out. He says, they pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality. He says, that's one of the big warnings. He says, you be careful. There's going to be people that are going to try to get into your church. And, and they're going to say, they're going to say, it's all about love. It's all about love. It's all about love. Love, 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 love. And they want to say, and I can do whatever. And God's grace forgives me for whatever I do, so I can do whatever I want. And they don't want to talk about the truth. So they're going to take the grace of God and the love of God, and they're going to so, so maximize on that that they can justify doing almost anything. And this is how you end up with pastors and priests and church leaders who can take the most innocent and most helpless among us and abuse them. Because they say, oh, because God's grace forgives me for everything. And here's the challenge. God's grace does forgive us, but there's truth. And there's things that are just wrong. And you've got people, people who, who can justify almost anything. And so, so at, here in our church, any person who ever helps with children's ministry goes through a police background check and they're fingerprinted. You say, well, you have to do that? Yes, we do. You say, well, are there cameras in the children's rooms? Yes, there are. And they're on all the time. And they record for a long enough time that if something happened, we know what happened. Yeah, and, and, you go, and some, some of you go, that's so sad. And I say, I agree, it's so sad, but it's necessary in our broken world. Because there are people who sneak in to churches who do things that are ungodly and are wrong, and they'll try to justify it by saying, well, God is loving, loving, loving. And that's true, but God is also the truth, the truth, and the truth, and some things are wrong. Someone say amen. amen. And so as a church, we sometimes have to make that stand. It's this, it's this thinking who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality that allows some pastors and church leaders to say, hey, I can do whatever I want. Because God will forgive me. It's what, it's what causes us to say things like, hey, I can party and go crazy Friday and Saturday night because I can confess on Sunday morning. And we justify and rationalize. I'll just keep doing my sin because God will keep forgiving me. In Romans chapter 6, the apostle Paul addresses exactly that topic. And the apostle Paul says, shall we continue to sin so that God's grace may abound or God's grace may increase. Because people in the church in the first century were saying, well, here's the thing. When I sin and sin and sin, God gives me grace and grace and grace. And grace is good, so the more I sin, the more grace I get. You see the perversion of that? But that's what they were saying. And so the apostle Paul says, he asked the question, shall I continue sinning so that grace may increase? And there's, there's four ways to say no in the Greek language. And they get more and more intense. The most intense of the four is may genoita. May it never be. May God forbid it. May it never happen. That's the note that the Apostle Paul uses. Shall I continue to sin because when I sin, God's grace abounds? May it never be so. And, and, and so, but, but when you get people who work their way into the church and they, they 
talk grace, grace, grace. I know of pastors, in this case it was male pastors, who have had women come to them for counsel and they've taken the weak and broken place in this woman's life and they've used it as a, as a way to then bring that woman into a sexually immoral activity with them as a pastor and they'll say to them, but God's gracious and God's loving and he wants the best for you and the best for you would be me to be involved with you. It's, it's perverse and ungodly and wrong and it still happens in our world. And Judah's saying, hey listen, these two big things, watch out. Watch out when somebody uses the grace of God as a license for immorality. Do we need to hear that warning today? What's the answer? Yeah. Just as much as they did back then. And then he goes on to the second warning. He says, watch out for those who compromise on the salvation and the lordship of Jesus. They not only you know, do this for, as a license for immorality, but they deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. He says, there are people who come into leadership in the church. There's pastors and leaders, and they start to compromise on who Jesus is and what he did and what he said. And they'll say things like this. Well, God is loving, he's loving, he's loving. You know, they'll just go, the love, 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 love. Don't want to talk about the truth, right? So they'll say, well, God's so loving that you know, Jesus is one of many ways to God. It's called universalism. But, there's, but anyone can get to God any way they want to. The problem is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And that makes us uncomfortable. It's like, well, that seems narrow and that seems limited. He says, yeah, but that's what Jesus said. Well, that makes me uncomfortable. That's okay, be uncomfortable but hold to what Jesus said. Will I stand for what Jesus says? And Judah's warning and saying, there's these people, these leaders in the church, that they're compromising on, on sexual morality because they're saying love, 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 and they're compromising on the word of God in terms of who Jesus Christ and salvation in Jesus because they're saying, well, God is loving, so certainly anyone can do anything they want and they still get to get in heaven. And that's not what the Bible teaches. The way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And, and some people say, well, that makes me uncomfortable. That's okay, be uncomfortable but hold to what the Bible teaches. If I, didn't, if I didn't believe this book is true, listen closely, I would not be your pastor. If we had a pastor on our staff who didn't believe this book is true, they wouldn't be your pastor. Because we have one book and we have one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we have to hold to this even when it's difficult, even when it's challenging. So then Jude goes on, and we see the next thing. God takes rebellion and sin very seriously, so should we. God takes sin, God takes rebellion very, very seriously. Look at me, with me at verses five to seven in Jude, and this gets intense. All right, this gets intense, and it's gonna make some of you uncomfortable. That's okay. Part of my job as a pastor is to make you uncomfortable sometimes if you're, if you're being confronted with the word of God. Jude, five, verses five to seven. He says, though you already know all this, I wanna remind you that the Lord at the time, at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. You see, well, that sounds like it says that God brought judgment on them. He did. That makes me uncomfortable. It should, but it's true. And verse six, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on, that great, on the great day. So it sounds like that there's angels that are fallen to rebel against God, that they're gonna be judged. That's what it says. Because God takes sin and rebellion very seriously. Verse seven, <coughs> In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. And people say, well, I don't know if I like that one either. People say, well, that's Old Testament stuff. No, Judas in the New Testament. It's the second to the last book of the New Testament. And God's word says that, that God is holy, holy, holy. And though he's loving, 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 he is also truth, 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 and he's holy, holy, holy. And we need to then grapple with that. And so here's the question, and I think the, the place to always go when we're grappling with these things is not everybody else, but right into our own heart. So here's the question. Where is sin and rebellion lurking in my heart and my life? It's so easy to point to everyone else or say what we don't want to hear about. But I think it's a good question for our, us to ask ourselves on a regular basis, where is their sin? Where is their rebellion lurking and hiding in my heart? And to bring it before the Lord. And some people that really want to focus on the grace of Jesus will say, well, I'm a Christian. I came to the cross. I received Jesus. And my sins are washed away. And I'd say, amen, they are. And, say, and when I stand before Jesus, he'll see me as perfectly pure and holy through Jesus Christ's work on the cross. And I'll say, amen, God will. But in this life, we still have to seek after holiness and turn away from sin. 
And although God has won the war, we have little battles and victories that we fight, and we have to walk in the victory of Jesus and walk in holiness. We need, need to choose and say, God, where am I turning my heart against you? Where am I living out of your will? And it should matter to us because it matters to God. How much does our sin matter to God? He laid down the life of his only son to pay for our sin. That's how much. It matters a lot to God. He's paid the price. Praise God. But he calls us to then walk in a way that honors him as best we can in the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And so then Jude goes on and basically says, beware Keep your gloves up. Be it's a battle. So Jesus said, it's a battle. Be in a readied stance. Keep your gloves up. Be ready to fight. Here's what he says in verses 17 to 19. But dear friends, remember that the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow, listen to this, mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. You've got to hear this. In our world today, this is critical. People who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. This is the world that we live in today. If it comes naturally to me, then I should do it. If I say it comes, I've always felt this way, I've always been this way, I've always wanted to live this way, I've always wanted to do this. If it comes naturally, I should do it. It would be untrue to myself to not do what comes naturally to me. Can you imagine what your life would be like, your family would be like, your health would be like, the church would be like, and our world would be like if everyone lived that way? If it comes naturally, I do it because that's the right thing to do. Really? Do you eat everything that you want to eat? I don't try to, I don't try to want to eat it. I just want to eat it. I don't have to try to want ice cream at 11 o'clock at night. I just, it comes naturally. Therefore, God wants me to do what comes naturally. I'll do it, right? No, God wants you to do what comes supernaturally. And so we say no to what comes naturally. Now, are there some things that come naturally that are good things? Yeah, there's some things. But most of what comes naturally to us is wrong. If everything that came naturally to me that I want to say, if, if everything that, that I naturally wanted to have come out of my mouth and say to somebody else, if I just, well, I, I want to say it. I, I want, I'm not even trying. I just want to tell them this. I'm going to say it. It would ruin every relationship I have. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding supernatural power of the Spirit of God help me shut my mouth right now and save my marriage and save my friendship and save my church. Save your church, right? I, I don't do what comes naturally most of the time because if I did, it would be destructive. And in our world right now, and, 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 and Jude is dealing with the issue of sexuality. In our world, the standard position right now, and, and, and I don't want to get into details, there's kids in the room, but the standard position right now, and this is on everything and anything. And at this point in our culture, it's almost everything and anything, except for maybe hurting children. But other, other than that, yeah. if, you feel, if you feel a natural desire to do, you feel, oh, it's natural, I want to, I've always wanted to, I like to, I want to, you should act on it. That's, the, that's what our culture says right now. And I would say, no, what does God call us to and let the supernatural power of Jesus overcome our natural desires? What if I have to fight those desires the rest of my life? You may have to. I have friends who are pastors. I have lots of pastor friends. and we talk together, we pray together. I have had pastor friends who have confided in me. I've had pastor friends, say, more than one pastor friend. These are men, male pastors who have said, I'm really struggling with feeling attracted to other women in my church besides my wife. And so how do I respond to that as a pastor? I'll say, well, does it feel natural to you? Do you? Are you trying to feel that way? No, I just feel that way. Okay, then go for it. <laughs> right? No. Right? No. no, of course not. I say, are you out of your mind? And they say, kind of. <laughs> I say, don't do it. In the, in the supernatural power of Jesus, you say no again and again and again and again. And you fight that. Why? Because oftentimes our natural desires are not what God wants for us. But his supernatural power is enough to change us. And you can apply that across the boards. We, we, but to stand in our world and to stand strong is hard to do. It's difficult to do. But we're called to keep our gloves up, to be ready to fight. <clears throat> what are ways we can stand against false teaching and the division it brings? How do we stand up? How do we push back? How do we fight back? We've got to continue to do that. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. And, th and, then, and then basically... Um, Jude says to us, get in shape and get into the fight. 
He says there's ways to stand strong and to resist these temptations that come, to not be that person who misleads others. And usually it's, it's usually out of, out of well, it's love, 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 but they're forgetting truth, 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 and how those go together. And so, so listen to these words from Jude 20, verses 20 to 23. There's at least six different ways that we can stand up and fortify ourselves and learn to stand strong when everything in the world is trying to push us in a different direction. So I want you, as I read this, if you have your own Bible, you can highlight or underline, if you, see if you notice these different six things, and then I'll walk through them very quickly. Here's what Jude says. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up, strengthening yourselves in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. As long as you have life, man, you fight for this. There's some things to fight for. This is one of them. Verse 22, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. What's my training program? Where do I need to, to get in shape? What do I need to do to stand strong, to know that when the, when the, the pressures come, I, I can stand strong on the word of God, and I can do it with love and kindness, but I'm going to do it with firmness, and I'm going to stand strong. Here's six ways to learn to stand strong. Number one. Building up your faith. He says, my dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith. And can I tell you, the best way to build yourself up into faith is to get to know this book. Read this book every day the rest of your life. And I love that Pastor Jeff Mannion, who was here preaching last week, he said, hey, if you read just one chapter a day, you'll read the whole Bible in three years. I did the math. You know what I figured out? If you read three chapters a day, <laughs> you'll read the whole Bible in one year. And three chapters a day takes about 10 to 15 minutes. If you want to be strong in your faith, know what the word of God says. And when it says something that bothers you, great, let it bother you. And talk to God about it. And when you say, but I don't know if I want to yield to what God calls me to yield to, you say, Lord, I want to learn to surrender. But know God's word. Build up your faith in the scriptures. Number two, praying in the Holy Spirit. By praying in the Holy Spirit, by asking for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill you. And I think especially in those times where you say, my natural desire for, for what I want to do is this, but it doesn't line up with God's supernatural will. Can I yield and surrender and submit my natural desire to the supernatural power of God? And can I tell you what? That's just part of the Christian journey. Dozens of times a day but I want to eat this, but I don't want to do that. And God says, but my power is enough to help you not do what you want, but what I long for you, because God says, I know what's best for you. Will you in prayer, in the power of the Spirit, surrender your life to God and follow his will, not your will. Your will be done, Lord, not my will. Number three, growing in God's love. Keep yourselves in God's love. Can I tell you one of the best ways to grow in God's love is to grow as a worshiper? Just tell God how much you love him. Sing songs of praise to God. When we gather together here, I want to challenge you. Open your mouth and lift your voice and worship God. It will grow your love for God because you're telling him of his glory, of his goodness. You're celebrating him. During the week, put on some great worship music and listen to great worship music. And if, whether you pick, you know, I've got about seven or eight channels on YouTube that are, that are basically just different worship, different worship bands, different worship groups. And when I hit a mix on that, it'll play for the next seven hours for me. And I just put it in the background on my desk. I just put it up on my screen over in the corner there. And I just, I have just that mute word. And, it, and I think it's good for my soul. It reminds me to st sometimes just stop and just worship God in the middle of the day. Just say, thank you. I, I want you to sometimes during my work day, I stop and just worship God. Is that okay if your pastor does that? <laughs> well, you're not working. Well, no, but I'm worshiping. And, and, that's, and that's, that's part of my day. Number four, being merciful and loving others. We need to build ourselves up in mercy. And I love in verse 22, Jesus says, be merciful to those who doubt. See, he's, he's dealing harshly and addressing the truth with false teachers. They're not, they're not doubting, they're deceiving. But if you have somebody in your church or somebody in your life who's doubting and struggling, God's boy, if they're doubting, then you bring mercy and you bring tenderness and you bring compassion. Here at Shoreline, if somebody comes into our church and they say, I'm not a Christian yet, I'm trying to figure out, I don't really know if I believe all this Jesus stuff. We're like, great, you're welcome, that's wonderful. There's mercy and love for those that are trying to figure out the whole Jesus thing. It's when somebody says, I know Jesus, and I'm going to mislead other people, and I'm going to harm people. So no, we're going to stand in the way of that. That's when you draw the line. But if somebody's struggling trying to figure out, we want to have mercy on them as they're walking towards Jesus. And then number five, rescuing others. We call around here, we call it organic outreach. 
Jude says, save others by snatching them from the fire. People that are heading far from God. He says, do all you can to pray for them, to love them, to serve them, to tell your story of faith, to tell Jesus' story, to invite them to places they're going to meet Christians and hear about Jesus. Be part of that journey of helping people walk toward Jesus and find his love and his grace and his hope and the hope of eternity. So rescue others. That's how you strengthen yourself is by reaching out to other people. And then number six, fleeing from evil. You know, growing in holiness. It says, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. There's so much garbage in our world. And if you want to grow strong in your faith, man, say, God, let me grow in holiness. Let me grow in looking more and more like Jesus. You say, well, I'm, but I came to the cross and I accepted Jesus. I'm forgiven of my sins. Absolutely. But, but you're still called to strive to be more like Jesus. And that's a lifelong challenge. Amen? Becoming like Jesus, loving like Jesus loves, forgiving like Jesus forgives, caring like Jesus cares, and turning away from all the enticements of this world and saying, I don't want any more to do with that. Yeah, my flesh wants that, and my natural desires long for that, but I know what God wants for me, and in the supernatural power of, the Jesus, of Jesus, I'm gonna walk in holiness and walk like Jesus. This, yeah, Jude, Jude, just, he, Jude just lays it out. And he says, listen, stand for what's right and for what's true, even when it costs you. And in our world, I will tell you, if you stand, even, even if you do it with lots of love and kindness, but you say, but no, there's things I believe and I have conviction of and I'm standing on those things. There's people that are not gonna understand. And they're gonna say, you're mean, you're unloving, you're unkind, you're bad. I've been called all kinds of names. And I said, but no, I'm actually very loving and compassionate, but I'm also gonna hold to God's truth. We can do both of those. And Jude says, for the sake of your life, for the sake of the church, let's stand against those things that undercut what God is doing. Let's do it with grace and love, but let's do it with strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, thank you that in this world that says anything goes and everything's fine, um, you say there is truth and there is beauty and there is goodness and there, is, there are things in Christ that we just can't compromise. And so I pray for Shoreline Community Church, for each person in this room, in the family worship venue, our congregation online. Lord, will you help us to stand in your name and stand deeply in your love with tender, compassionate hearts. But let us also stand for you, Lord Jesus, because you stood for us. And let us lay our lives down for you, Jesus, because you laid your life down for us. And empower us to be able to declare, this I believe. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit.